All right, 2 Kings chapter 12. Let's just dive right in here. Verse number 1, the Bible reads, In the seventh year of Jehu, Jehoash began to reign. And forty years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Zibiah of Beersheba. And Jehoash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all his days, wherein Jehoiada the priest instructed him. Now, if you remember from last week, um, Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, when Ahaziah was killed, she killed all the seed royal, all the children that would have been king in Ahaziah's place. But she missed one, and that was Joash that we're reading about here in this chapter. And he was an infant when she did all that. He was hid. Jehoiada ended up raising him. And when he was seven years old, that's when they put the crown on his head and they made him king and they killed Athaliah, right? And they made a covenant with God and saying that, you know, we're going to be God's people and, you know, he's going to be a king for the Lord and all this other stuff. So that was all established in the previous chapter. Now we're going to get into the reign of Joash just in his one chapter because he dies at the end. And um, right, right off the bat, I want you to put a place in 2 Chronicles 24. Just keep a marker there, because we're going to be going back and forth. There's more information. You, you get the full picture of everything that happens when we go back and forth between the two. And some of the things that happen, like him being killed here at the end of the chapter, we have no idea why that happens just from 2 Kings chapter 12. But we, read, we get a lot more details on that in, that other, in the other chapter. But we're going to be you know, kind of going back and forth to get the full picture of everything that happens here in the sermon tonight. So just keep a bookmarker there or we'll be flipping back and forth. Now, um, he started being raised when he, you know, or sorry, became king when he was seven. And, but basically, Jehoiada has been the one who's been the leader. Now, he was the priest, right? So he was raising him up, but the captain of the guard listened to Jehoiada. The people were listening to Jehoiada because he's a child, right? I mean, even though he's the king, yeah, it was monumentous, and they were going to honor him as a king. He's still not ru like literally ruling the people because he's seven years old. I mean, it's just not the way they do it. Jehoiada is the one that would be his co-regent, the one who would be helping him make the decisions and things like that until he got a little bit older to be able to handle it himself. That's what happened. But we see a lot of things happen in, in the life of Jehoash. And um, it's important to note, we're going to get into this later in the sermon, but in verse number two, it says, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all his days wherein Jehoiada the priest instructed him. So as long as he had Jehoiada there, as long as he was there to kind of instruct him and guide him and give him direction, he did everything that was right in the sight of the Lord. But we're going to see later after Jehoiada's gone that, that he starts making really foolish choices and he's listening to bad counsel and he's just led astray. But I'm going to get into all that a little bit later in the sermon. Let's keep reading here. Verse number three, the Bible reads, but the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places. So basically he's saying, he did right in the sight of the Lord, but the high places still existed. And you're going to find that with many people in the Bible that do great things, their heart's right with God, but they still just don't get rid of the high places. They still just lack the ability to break down the idols, to break down these places of worship that people esteem so much, these high places. Were, were God commanded not to be done, for whatever reason, they, they allow that to happen, whether it's just because they, they want to still have some level of popularity, I don't know. Whatever the reason is, you find that with many of the kings. It's not just Jehoash, there's many of them. This is like a common thread that's just like this cancer that sticks with the children of Israel, like almost all throughout their existence, that, you know what, there's still these stinking high places here. You know, they're getting so many things right, and God bless them for it, and God does bless them for it. But he's still just like, they left the high places. But that's a whole sermon in and of itself. I don't want to go down that path because he's one of many that did that. Let's keep reading here. Verse number four. And Jehoash said to the priests, all the money of the dedicated things that is brought into the house of the Lord, even the money of everyone that passeth the account, the money that every man is set at, and all the money that cometh into any man's heart, to bring into the house of the Lord, let the priests take it to them, every man of his acquaintance, and let them repair the breaches of the house, wheresoever any breach shall be found. 
So what he's saying here is that when people come in and bring in their dedicated things, and they bring in basically these free will offerings, and they're bringing money into church, they're bringing money into the house of God, they're saying, okay, priests, you're going to take that money, and I want you to repair anything that needs to be fixed, any breaches, any you know, holes, oh, we got plumbing problems here, we got, you know, what, you know, obviously I'm talking modern terms, but whatever's going on in the house of God that needs to be fixed, the roof is caving in, let's get that repaired, let's, you know, let's build this place back up. Because remember, it's been dormant. You know, I mean, uh, the, we've just came from Athaliah, who's a Baal worshiper, and Ahaziah is another wicked man. You know, these people who didn't worship the Lord. Now they've, hey, let's do things right. Jehoash wants to do the right thing here. He's saying, let's, you know, you take this money. This is how we're going to fund it. Take this money and use it to repair the breaches. Now, um, turn, if you would, to 2 Chronicles 24. We're going to see, a, again, a little bit more detail on this because we see in 2 Kings 12, Essentially, he's, he's telling them, you know, all the money of the dedicated things brought into the house of the Lord and the stuff that people bring under free will. But we see a little bit more detail in, in, in another way to get the money is added in 2 Chronicles 24 because he also tells them to go and collect the money from the people. 2 Chronicles 24, verse number 5, the Bible reads, And he gathered together all the priests and the Levites and said unto them, Go out unto the cities of Judah and gather of all Israel money to repair the house of your God from year to year and see that ye hasten the matter, howbeit the Levites hastened it not. And the king called for Jehoiada the chief and said unto him, Why hast thou not required of the Levites to bring in out of Judah and out of Jerusalem the collection according to the commandment of Moses, the servant of the Lord? and of the congregation of Israel for the tabernacle of witness. And then jump down to verse number nine there, it says, and they made a proclamation through Judah and Jerusalem to bring into the Lord the collection that Moses, the servant of God, laid upon Israel in the wilderness. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up and making a point of this, it's one thing to use the money that people are bringing in of their own free will to, to do this stuff. I think that's legitimate and righteous. Everything's fine with that. But then he's going out. It's, it's almost like he's taxing them by going out and kind of compelling them. Say, you know, you go out to them and collect for the, the, the house of the Lord. And he brings up, oh, like Moses did in the wilderness. But you know what? That's not what Moses did in the wilderness. Now, the reference that it's talking about, I'll read it for you, is in Exodus 25. There's a couple of places where you can find this out. Exodus 25, verse 2 says, speak unto the children of Israel. This was God telling Moses. Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. And then when you jump down later, it says, and the congregation went out and they came back and brought things to Moses. So they're bringing it to Moses. They came, they brought it into the house of God. They weren't, Moses wasn't sending people out into the congregation going out to like to get people to, to you know say hey where's your money you know, bring it here but that's what jehoash was sending the people out and he was using this example of moses building the tabernacle to do that now using the funds and asking people to give freely for the cause of you know repairing the house of the lord was there's nothing wrong with that that's perfectly fine. Amen and amen. I mean, and that, that is what Moses was doing. God said, hey, anyone who's willingly, anyone whose heart is just desires to help and they want to give, however each man wants to give, let him so give. And that's how they built the tabernacle. Because they just, whatever people brought, everyone worked together, people provided resources, they provided their talents, they provided whatever it is that they had, and they built the tabernacle for the Lord. Good model. And that's what he's starting to do here, but then he's like, well, go out and take it from people. You see, we take an offering here. We, we take a collection, and part of that goes to pay for, you know, if we have any repairs within this meeting place that we have, to pay for our rent, to pay for utility, you know, whatever things we need to pay for. Yeah, and that comes in based off of the offerings that people give. But we're not going out and, like, writing you letters and sending you, like, hey, you got to give. And you know what? Some churches do that. Some churches have the attitude that Jehoash had of like, hey, go out into all Israel, into the cities, and get the money from them. Look, that's not the way things are supposed to operate. Just because someone does that in the Bible does not make it biblically accurate to do that.
Jehoash did that, but I think he was wrong in doing that because he was quoting Moses and what happened in the wilderness, and that's not the way it went down. They brought it in. So um, the way that we do things here, though, well, let's get into that. I'm going to read a few more verses because um, I'm not quite there yet. There's, there's another way of, of doing collection. I'll explain how and why we do the collections here. I don't think it's a very big deal in general about how the way we collect money and things like that, but it's a necessity. It's, it's something that needs to be done. You know, there was a necessity here. Hey, the house of the Lord needs to be repaired, right? So let's fix this. Let's do this. Now, Jehoash didn't, you know, I mean, he, he, he had a good intent and a good heart, and he, was, and he gave all these right things to do, except there's that one thing, like, no, you don't need to do that. But you know what? God doesn't make a real big deal about that in the Bible. I'm just pointing that out, that even though he did that, that's not the way that things ought to be done, I believe. Now, let's keep reading in 2 Kings 12. Verse number 6, the Bible says, But it was so that in the 3 and 20th year of King Jehoash, the priests had not repaired the breaches of the house. Then King Jehoash called for Jehoiada the priest and the other priests and said unto them, Why repair ye not the breaches of the house? Now therefore receive no more money of your acquaintance, but deliver it for the breaches of the house. And the priests consented to receive no more money of the people, neither to repair the breaches of the house. So understand what happened here. The king tells the priests, he says, look, the house of the Lord needs to be repaired and you're going to do it. And, the, and in order to do it, you're going to receive this money from the people in order to buy the resources, repair, do the repairs and do everything I've done for your labor, everything else. You want you to do it. And what happened was the priests were collecting the money and not doing any of the work. Now, there's a lot of problems with that. <laughs> Okay, first and foremost, there's a lot of things going on here. And then when he calls them out on it, they say, okay, well, we won't take any more money, but we're still not going to do the work. What kind of lousy attitude is that? But, but for one, you can see right off the bat, the priests didn't have respect under the king's commandment. Who was in charge there? I mean, the king was supposed to be in charge, right? And was he telling them to do anything that was like against God's laws by repairing the, the house of the Lord? No. The only thing he did tell them to do that, that probably they shouldn't have done was to go out and collect the money. But they had no problem with that part of it. Yeah, okay, we'll go collect some money. The problem they had was with the working aspect of it. And we have too many priests these days that like to collect the paycheck. And I was just talking about this during the announcements right? when we're taking up our collection for our missionary that we support. Too many people want to collect the paycheck. They're willing to go out and collect money, right? These missionaries want to go out and collect money from all these churches in order for them to go and do no work and sit on the rear end, rear end and complain about how hard it is. And, oh, I've got to learn the language. Oh, I've got to do this. Oh, I've got to, you don't understand the culture. These people just don't want to talk to you about the gospel. And all the excuses in the world when the real reason is that they just don't want to do the work. They don't care that the house of God is in shambles spiritually in these countries. They just care about getting paid. And I think a lot of them, if you were to say, well, you know what? We're not going to pay you if you're not going to do the work. They're going to say, okay, don't pay us, but we're still not going to do the work. A rotten attitude to have. That's wicked. Now, look, Jehoiada and the priests were doing a good thing in general was when they brought up Jehoash and, you know, trying to get people right with God. But when it came down to it, I mean, repairing the house of the Lord, like, why would you not do that? The priests didn't seem to care that much about doing that. And they actually seemed kind of lazy. Just not willing to do the work. Another lesson to be learned from this, though, as well, is that Jehoash was probably hiring the wrong people to get things done. If you want to get things done, you know, these priests, apparently, they weren't handymen. <laughs> they, they might not have even known how to do the repairs on the house. And they should have, they should have been able to do it. Okay, I'm not giving it just, a, just a, you know, a free card to the priests. But when you want to get things done, you've got to get the right people for the job. Right? The priests are going to be the best at, hopefully, you know, reaching the people, 
you know, in this case, performing the sacrifices, doing all the things in the service of the Lord. And if you have to hire some carpenter, some mason to get the, the, the other jobs done, then, then do that. Don't give these guys some other busy work to do. I mean, hey, what if, the, what if the priests were busy just doing the business of God's work and they didn't have time to go and, and get up on a ladder and, and spackle the, you know, the house or whatever? That would be acceptable. Then I would say, you know what? These guys aren't lazy. They've got their priorities right. They're not quite as focused on the building as they are about doing the work of the Lord. And that's why the disciples, you see in the New Testament, when... He says, not meat for us to go and serve tables. When there was a legitimate job to be done, but they're like, we're too busy for that. We're going out and preaching the gospel. We've got this other work to be done in the word. You know, we need to hire more people to get this other job done because the job's important. Hey, repairing the house of the Lord was important, but get the right people for the right job. I mean, the priests don't necessarily need to be going up and getting on ladders and doing that when they could be doing other things that would be more important, but hire people to get that done. Again, it's wrong for the priest to just be collecting money and sitting on it and not doing the work that you're supposed to be doing for that money. Obviously, really wicked. But if you want to get these things done, hey, get these people's priorities right and, and manage the people right. I think the king had a, heart, had, a, had a lot of problems here with leading, with delegating. He was, he was used to taking his orders from Jehoiada from a child and that didn't seem to stop going up into adulthood. Because if he was able to make the orders and be a good leader, the people would have listened when he told them to do something instead of just, it's like they didn't hear him. It's ignoring the work that they told him to do. And it seemed like there was no consequence for it either. Verse number nine. The Bible says, But Jehoiada the priest took a chest and bored a hole in the lid of it and set it beside the altar. On the right side as one cometh into the house of the Lord and the priests that kept the door put therein all the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. And it was so when they saw that there was much money in the chest that the king's scribe and the high priest came up and they put up in bags and told the money that was found in the house of the Lord. That means they counted it. And they gave the money being told into the hands of them that did the work, that had the oversight of the house of the Lord. And they laid it out to the carpenters and builders that wrought upon the house of the Lord. So now they finally came up with a new plan. They say, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. The money that's going to be used for this, we're just going to make this box, right? A lock box. And we'll just, as the money comes in, we'll just keep on putting in this lock box. When it fills up, we'll have enough money then to divvy out to say, okay, let's hire some carpenters. Let's hire some builders. Let's hire these people and get it done. That's what they did. Now, I'm going to use this time to kind of point out why we collect the money we do. It seems like a silly thing. You know, some people make a real big issue about this. And they make a real big point out of doing things different. And there's churches that will follow this model of having like a box in another room or a box somewhere in the back where you could, you know, anonymously put your money in and stuff. And you know what? If they want to do that, fine. But don't do that thinking that you're doing that like more scripturally than passing a plate around because these people had problems with money and that's why they even did things the way they did here because the priests were taking the money and not doing anything with it. So it's like, okay, we're going to solve this problem by locking up the money so you can't just go and use it and spend it for anything else. And this is this fund for this purpose. That's not the way that they normally would handle receiving anything from people. This was a different measure to do for, to solve a particular problem. Okay, so this isn't like the way that God intended money to be collected within the church. Now, and like I said, hey, if people want to do that, go ahead. I don't think it's wrong to do that. But the problem is that people who want to do things certain, you know, these ways are going to say, well, you're doing it wrong because you pass a plate around, you know. And people get hung up on these issues that honestly, the Bible really doesn't say much about at all. How is the collection, you know, how is a lot of things done within the church? God's given us freedom to, to operate in a way that we see fit without putting every single micromanaged detail on how things ought to be done. Now, obviously, we shouldn't be making a production about the money that we give and sounding the trumpet so that you get all this glory and honor by giving so much money. But I'll tell you what, when we pass our plate to collect an offering from people, 
No one sounding a trumpet. In fact, we have little envelopes that you can be very discreet about anything that you put in there, if at all. And, you know, obviously no one should just be looking. And my, you know, like, I'm not, I don't care. You know, whoever, you know, gives or doesn't give, that's none of my business. Honestly, that's between you and God. Now, I believe that tithing in the New Testament is still scriptural and, and biblical and accurate. But again, I'm going to teach that. I've taught that before. And at the end of the day, that's between you and God, what you do with that. And I'm not going to treat anybody any different regardless of any amount of money they do or do not put in there. It doesn't matter. Every way of collecting money, you're going to have some problem that you can find with it. But I'll tell you what, not collecting money in any way is going to be, in my opinion, causing people to sin. Because if you're not giving away a means to collect the tithe, and I believe the tithe is scriptural, then I'm going to be causing people to sin. So, I mean, we've got to do this somehow. And that's, I mean, the way that you do it, like I said, we could have a box back there, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I'm not going to look down on people for passing a plate or however they decide to do some form of collection that's relatively anonymous, right? I mean, we're not just standing up and saying, I'm going to give this and I'm going to, you know, no. You give or you don't give, it's up to you. But it's all done willingly. And I'm not mailing off a, a remit statement, a bill statement, like to your house and saying, okay, here's what you owe to church, you know, fill it out and give it back to us. Kind of like what Jehoash was trying to do to get the, the, you know, hey, we've got these repairs to do. Here's your part of the bill. You know, you're, you're, co you're all coming to church here, so... You know, you get one twentieth of this. We're going we're to split it up evenly. I'm going to send you a bill. That's not how it works. So, it, you know, like I said, it, it's, not even a, it's not even really an issue to me how it's done. But I don't want people getting screwed up because there's all kinds of nonsense. You know, especially if you spend a lot of time on the Internet, there's all kinds of nonsense out there. And people want to make mountains out of molehills. And especially on things that the Bible really doesn't talk a lot about. But this is one of those passages that they'll say, well, this is why you should do it this way. And that's why I'm bringing it up, because it's not that big of a deal. So we're going to continue to do things the way that we do things, and um, I'm sure that God has no problems with that. So uh, if you have any further questions about that, you can talk to me after service, but you're probably not going to get any, anywhere changing my mind on this subject. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 12. And to masons and hewers of stone... So again, he's, he's giving this money now. It, I, we stopped mid-sentence, so... He's giving the money to, to those that, that are working in the house of the Lord, to masons, hewers of stones, to buy timber and huge stone to repair the breaches of the house of the Lord and for all that was laid out for the house to repair it. Howbeit there were not made for the house of the Lord bowls of silver, snuffers, basins, tr excuse me, trumpets, any vessels of gold or vessels of silver of the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. Now, um, well, let's keep reading here. Verse number 14. But they gave that to the workmen and repaired therewith the house of the Lord. Moreover, they reckoned not with the men into whose hand they delivered the money to be bestowed on the workmen, for they dealt faithfully. Now, in 2 Chronicles 24, I'm going to bring up a, another supposed contradiction here, but it's not. What this is saying in 2 Kings 12 is that he said, all the money that was collected was given to the people who were working on fixing the breaches of the house, any repairs that needed to be done. And they're saying the money that came in, they didn't use it to spend for the utensils in the service of the Lord, which is the, the bowls, the trumpets, this, you know, all these other things that they would use as instruments in the service of God. Okay? Now we're going to see that they did end up getting those instruments in 2 Chronicles 24. But I just want to help you to see, to see the difference here of what it's saying. Um, because it said that they didn't use that money. They gave all of that money to the workers in 2 Kings chapter 12. Now look at verse 24 of 2 Chronicles, or excuse me, verse 12 of 2 Chronicles 24. The Bible says, And the king and Jehoiada gave it to such as did the work of the service of the house of the Lord, and hired masons and carpenters to repair the house of the Lord, and also such as wrought iron and brass to mend the house of the Lord. No contradiction there. It's exactly the same thing. Right? They gave the money to the workers to work for the house of the Lord. So the workmen wrought, and the work was perfected by them, and they set the house of God in his state and strengthened it. And when they had finished it, 
they brought the rest of the money before the king and Jehoiada, whereof were made vessels for the house of the Lord, even vessels to minister and offer withal, and spoons and vessels of gold and silver. And they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord continually all the days of Jehoiada. So basically what happens is the workmen, because they dealt faithfully, the Bible says, faithfully means they said, you know what? Here's all of this money get the job done and use whatever you need to use to get this work done. So they did. They used all the materials, the resources. They, they fixed the house. They got everything repaired. And when they were done, they said, hey, the workmen were being honest and said, okay, you know what? We didn't actually need all of this. So here's your remainder. Here's, here's what's left, right? Because we, we actually didn't need all of this. You gave us too much. And then from whatever was left over, they made the, the spoons and vessels of gold and silver and what, you know, whatever else then they had left over to do that for. But that wasn't the original intent. That's not what they paid them for. They ended up creating that after the fact, after they knew that they had some money left over. So it's not a contradiction. You know, when you see in 2 Kings 12 that says, and they didn't use that money to do all these other things, it's because they did give all of it for the repair of the house and not for the extra stuff they ended up being able to make the extra stuff because there was some money then left over. Now, um, I do want to point out when it says that they just bestowed all this money on the workmen, it says for they dealt faithfully. It seemed to have worked out for them, but I don't recommend doing this either. There's nothing wrong <laughs> with accounting for what you give somebody to do. This seems to have been a problem with them. Right? I mean, Jehoash was having a problem getting these priests to do the work and holding them accountable. Hey, I gave you money. Why aren't you doing this? Well, now we've got the priests giving this money to the workers and just saying, oh, yeah, just get that done. You got to hold people accountable or else you're just going to, you know, you don't want to just be wasting the money that's brought into the house of the Lord. And this is important, especially people who are managing finances. Like, I'm managing the money that's brought into this church. This is not my money in any sense of the word whatsoever, the money that comes into this church. It belongs to God. It's given by you and by me to God. That's why you give the money. That's why I give my money. My earnings goes into this church. It does not come for, in any sense of the word to me. And because it's God's money, I need to make sure that I am appropriating these and making sure that, hey, whatever money is coming in, it's going to be used completely to get jobs done, to get the, in, you know, I'm not just going to go and waste a bunch of money. You know, I look, I shop around. When we get things like those USBs or whatever, hey, I'm shopping around because why just blow and waste a bunch of money when we could use these resources to get more out of it? They could have planned to get these extra vessels and stuff had they been diligent saying, hey, you know, we're going to do this. I'm giving you this money. Get this job done and count the cost and know how much it's going to be instead of just coming just, well, we've got this money in this barrel. Let's just give that to them and just see if that's good enough. They ought to be more diligent in taking care of the things of the house of God. Amen. Now, look, I'm all, I'm all for giving people the benefit of the doubt and allowing people to get work done and dealing with them faithful in that regard. But you need to be following up with people and making sure the job's getting done. And I, 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 I never just overpay someone and say, well, just give me back whatever is left over. You know what I mean? Like, that's just a foolish way to deal with it because now you're just, just offering up a temptation to steal or, or to come up with some reasons to, to rip you off. And why do that? There's no purpose to it. Like, you're, you're not being any more godly that way. When you hire someone to, to earn, you know, to do work, then you agree with it. You make, a, you make the contract, and that's it. And you're obliged to it on each end. So, anyhow, I just want to point that out. I mean, again, there's a lot of statements in the Bible, but it doesn't mean that they're always right in the things that they do. They're not right to just go out and just collect all this money from people and bring it in. They're not right to just say, well, whatever, just going to deal faithfully with you. It could be looked at as a virtue, but I don't see how it is at all. I think it's being lazy. 
And I think that's something that was indicative from this chapter that we're seeing of these people. Let's keep reading here in 2 Kings. Chapter 16, or verse 16. The trespass money and sin money was not brought into the house of the Lord. It was the priests. Then Hazael, king of Syria, went up and fought against Gath and took it. And Hazael set his face to go up to Jerusalem. And Jehoash, king of Judah, took all the hallowed things that Jehoshaphat and Jehoram and Ahaziah's fathers, kings of Judah, had dedicated, and his own hallowed things, and all the gold that was found in the treasures of the house of the Lord and in the king's house, and sent it to Hazael, king of Syria, and he went away from Jerusalem. And the rest of the acts of Joash and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And his servants arose and made a conspiracy and slew Joash in the house of Milo, which goeth down to Silla. For Josachar, the son of Shimeath, and Jehozabad, the son of Shomer, his servants, smote him and he died. And they buried him with his fathers in the city of David, and Amaziah's son reigned in his stead. That's the end of the chapter. Now, we're going to look at the closer look at the demise of Joash and what his major downfall was, his major problems was. We see a lot of it right here at the end. Now, the first half of the chapter, he's trying to do what's right. He's building up the house of the Lord, right? He's, he's saying, hey, let's repair the house of God. Let's do this and get it right. And then what happens? He, feel, he faces a conflict. His ale comes up and threatens him, and he gets scared. Now the very thing, hey, let's put all this money into the house of God. Hey, let's take all this money from the house of God and just give it to this wicked person to save us, to save our own skin, instead of relying on the God that we're trying to build up this house for. Why are you putting all the money and resources to a God that you're not, you don't even have faith in? Or at least enough faith to resist the devil that's coming up and attacking you. Because he didn't have nearly the spine to, to stand up or the, I mean more importantly not just the spine the faith that God would protect I mean hey they were starting to do what's right why wouldn't you rely on God because he had a very shallow faith that's why extremely shallow it's almost like I mean he was worried about the surface the outside appearance how does the house of the Lord look and not worried about what's going on inside the house of the Lord are we doing things right? Because that's what matters more than a crack in the wall. Let's make a, the house of the Lord, you know, spiritually strong. Let's, let's get the inside workings working great and doing right by God and having that faith in God. And yeah, let's fix the outside too, but puts all that investment into the house of the Lord. First sign of threat what did he do? He took the money from the treasures of the house of the Lord, the dedicated thing, the things that, you know, because as kings, they're wealthy. So the, the Jehoshaphat and Joash and Ahaziah, you know, these, or I mean, excuse me, Joram and Ahaziah and these people that, that had this money, they dedicated things to the house of God. They had given this, and he said, you know what, I'm going to take all of that now. I'm going to steal from you now, God, just to pay off this wicked person who's threatening me and to get him to run away from me because I don't want to deal with this battle right now. I just want to have peace. A lot of problems with that. He had a very shallow, you know, he tried to do good, but I, I think, like, he seemed to never really get it. He was raised by Jehoiada, but he didn't ever really get it. The important things, it just, it just, it didn't sink in with him. He was concerned with the structure of the house of God, but not what was inside. He had a good counselor that he listened to, and that's why, you know, I made note of that in uh, verse number two, that he did right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada. He had a good counselor and he listened to that counselor. But he didn't, he, he heard him, but he didn't really learn from him. Because it didn't stick with him. He, he would hear it and do what he was told, which ended up being right. He had a good counselor. But when that counselor was gone, when that leader that he was following was gone, then he didn't know what to do. He was not a good leader himself and he relied too much on Jehoiada to give him direction that he needed. And following a good leader is important. So I'm going to read this for you. Turn if you would to, um, turn if you would to James chapter 1. Keep a place, actually, yeah, keep your place in 2 Chronicles 24 because we're still going back to that. There's still more that I want to cover that was not brought up in first King, second Kings 12. But 
see, Jehoash could have learned, like he had a great leader to learn from in Jehoiada. Because Jehoiada was bold. He stood up to Athaliah. He did the right thing. And he helped out Joash so that he could do the right thing too. He, he was a good counselor. And following a good leader, I believe, is important. There's many places throughout the Bible and, and many examples throughout the Bible where you have a good leader and a good follower and then that follower becomes a good leader, right? The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, he said, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. There's nothing wrong with following a man if that man is following Christ. A lot of people want to talk down, oh, you follow this man, you follow that man. Well, you know what? That's fine because the Apostle Paul said, hey, follow me as I follow Christ. So as long as you're is the man that you look up to as a good leader, as a solid leader, as someone who's following Christ, is following Christ, as long as they're doing that, then follow that man. Yeah, because they provide good examples. They're showing you wisdom. They're showing you how to do things and they're leading. You can't have every single person be a leader within a group. Because if all are leaders, then there's no followers. And everyone's going to be leading in a different direction. We, we, you know, we have churches that have leaders, but it's also important to, be a to have followers too. And it doesn't mean that the follower is less knowledgeable or is stupid or, you know, like can't think for themselves. It doesn't mean any of those things just means that you're falling into a position, into a role that's going to make the whole body stronger. You could be a good leader and still, when it's time to follow, you follow. You could be a good soldier and the strongest, baddest soldier, you know, but like you need to stay within your rank in order for the whole you know, the, the whole operation that's, that's being taken place to go smoothly and to go right and, and to not have any problems. You can't just take over, you know, like, and, and have these dual leaderships and split your platoon or whatever into different factions because then all of a sudden your force is depleted, right? I mean, if that makes sense. So we all need to be able to, to come into a point where we could follow, but also lead. And the person that you're following, as long as they're following Christ, and they're, as soon as they stop following Christ, yeah, don't follow them anymore. But having a leader is good. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing to be ashamed of to say, yeah, I follow this person. There's people that I follow. Now within this church, I'm leading. And I'm going to follow anyone. There's multiple people that I follow that are following Christ because I don't know everything and I like to learn too. But when it comes to this place and this church, I'm a leader here. And that's the way that this church runs. So as long as I'm following Christ, then you have someone within this church to follow. Now, um, obviously, you need to have your own faith and your own beliefs. We're not a cult. <laughs> we don't believe in cults. We don't want you just worshiping a man and just doing whatever the man says. Because our beliefs come from this book. And you have to be able to understand what you believe and be able to show why you believe what you do believe from the scripture because this should be the authority and this is the ultimate authority. Otherwise, how are you going to even know if a leader is following Christ? Well, you have to know about Christ. You have to know about you know, God's word. And um, you have established for yourself your faith and your belief and be grounded and founded in that truth. And that way, if a leader is gone for any reason, because lots of reasons why leaders are gone. They die for any reason, they could just die, right? Just be gone, all of a sudden there's no more leader. They can backslide, get into sin, right? And no longer be qualified to lead. And that could be even more dangerous because if all you're doing is relying on a leader and that leader fails you, that could overthrow your faith because you put too much investment into a man. But if you're grounded in your faith and you understand what you believe and you're firm in your, in your beliefs based on God's word, whether the leader dies, fails you, you're going to say, well, he failed, but God doesn't fail. 
So I'm not going to follow him anymore. I'll find someone else who's following Christ or I'll lead. I mean, you know, whatever. Just This is the way, though, you can't let any of that shake you. So when Jehoiada died, see, Joash, he didn't have that firm foundation. He didn't have that firm faith. Jehoiada made the covenant with God and between the, the, the king and the people and, and God and the king and stuff like that. But Joash didn't really know where to stand. He didn't really know what to believe. Look at James chapter 1, verse number 22. And look, because the responsibility is on you. You cannot use the excuse, and God says you cannot use the excuse of, well, pastor said to do this and it was wrong but i did it anyways and god will not grant you an excuse for you sinning because you followed a wicked leader it's the same argument that you know the, the, the popular argument of like well the nazis saying that oh well we were commanded to do this yeah but if you're doing something that's wicked and vile and something that you should not be doing then that's not an excuse just saying someone told me to do it you know, if I tell you to go out and murder, you know, 100 people and go out on a jihad or something and you listen to me and do it, you can't just use it. Well, he told me to do it. Well, no, you, you have to decide for yourself what you're going to do. Okay, now, I am going to be held responsible, you know, if I were to do something like that or the leader that leads you astray. Yeah, and God's going to hold them to even a higher standard. The leader, the pastor, whoever is trying to, to, to lead you in a certain direction there is culpability there, but it doesn't absolve the other person. I mean, Adam and Eve were the perfect example of this. You have Eve blaming the serpent, right? Well, it's not my fault, you know, the serpent. Told me. And then Adam saying, well, I mean, it's not my fault. She did it, right? And they're all pointing the fingers somewhere else, and they all got cursed. God held them all responsible. So you, all, you need to be responsible for what you believe. Yes, you could follow leader. Yes, come to church. Yes, listen to teaching and preaching. But ultimately, you have to decide. You have to discern you have to compare and say, is what I'm hearing found in Scripture, is it true? The responsibility lies on you. And James chapter 1, look at verse number 22. This is going to be a way for you to retain your knowledge and to make sure you're grounded and founded and rooted in your beliefs. The Bible says in verse 22, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. When you start putting into action and putting into use the things that you hear, the things that you learn, that's going to stick with you. That's what's going to stay with you over the course of life. You could read things in the Bible, and then if you don't put it in the action, you're, just, you're going to forget it. It's just going to be like you never even heard it to begin with. And if, and if that's the way that you live your life, you are not going to be grounded and rooted in God's Word to be able to withstand when the leader fails you, when the man of God fails you or gets into sin or something. Then you're just going to be toppled over because... You haven't been putting the, the, the good words of the Lord into, into practice in your life and continuing to grow. And, you know, because when you grow, you don't just grow upward, you take root downward. And that root downward is what's going to maintain and help you to last. And you cannot get that growth without putting into practice the things that you hear and continuing to learn and to grow and apply it and not just, not just have, rely on someone else to make all of your decisions for you. Making decisions requires wisdom. If you're going to make right decisions, it requires wisdom and knowledge. And you get that through God's word, right? Joash didn't have much wisdom or knowledge because he wasn't able to make the right choices and was always relying on someone else to make those choices for him. Now, Jehoiada was a good person as far as relying on someone to make choices for you, right? But the problem is Jehoiada didn't live forever, <laughs> physically speaking. He lived a long time. He lived 130 years. We're going to see that in 2 Chronicles 24, which turn, if you would, to 2 Chronicles 24. He lived a really long time. But as soon as he was gone, 
Joash made mistakes, and Joash screwed up, and he got the wrong people around him. Second Chronicles 24, look at verse number 13. The Bible says, So the workmen wrought, and the work was perfected by them, and they set the house of God in his state and strengthened it. And when they had finished it, they brought the rest of the money before the king and Jehoiada, wherever were made vessels for the house of the Lord, even vessels of minister, and to offer withal, and spoons and vessels of gold and silver. And they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord continually all the days of Jehoiada. So while Jehoiada was there, hey, they're making the burnt offerings. Everything's going great continually, right? Things are still being done right. You got the man of God. He's, he's still leading the right way. It says, but, in verse 15, but Jehoiada waxed old and was full of days when he died. And 130 years old was he when he died. It was a long time to live. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings. Because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and toward his house, he was looked up to and respected. They even buried him with the kings. And the reason being is because he was acting as king and he did a good job at it. When Joash was young and he was leading the people in the right direction, so they gave him the reverence and honor of burying him with the kings of the house of David. But he died. Look at verse 16 and they, and, or verse 17. Now after the death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king. Then the king hearkened unto them. Now as soon as Jehoiada is out of the picture, what happens? The wolves come in. Which just says, the princes of Judah come in. Now, I believe when it says the princes, I mean, prince means the first, the people who are kind of in charge. It could be like lower rulers, like just under the king or whatever, the princes of Judah. But I still think this is talking about more like spiritually. You know, we fight, against, we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, you know, spiritual weakness of high places. We, we, that is the fight we go against. And for a while, Jehoiada is able to stave that off because he's a righteous man leading a righteous way. But as soon as he's out of the picture... Now you've got these princes, these principalities, these wicked people that are coming in and um, trying to influence a king. And they made obeisance to him, right? They played the part. They flattered with their tongue and say, oh, king, you're so great. And then, and then oh, okay, that's enough for me to listen to you then. He couldn't spot the wicked men because he was easily deceived because he didn't know how to make decisions, because he didn't have knowledge, because he was relying on a man his whole life. So now other people come in, influential people. Oh, we'll make obeisance to the king, and he'll listen to us. And now they're running the kingdom, whereas Jehoiada was running it before. Because everyone was able to, apparently, to walk all over Joash, because he wasn't able to, to learn for himself and be a good leader. It says in verse um, 18, because that's what it says when it says the king hearkened unto them. It means he listened unto them. Whatever they said, then that's what he was doing which ended up being the exact opposite of what Jehoiada was doing. Verse 18, And they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this, their trespass. The same guy that's saying, Hey, let's build the house of the Lord is now saying, Let's forsake the house of the Lord and go serve idols. The double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He was not grounded and founded in the truth. And you need to watch out for this so that you are grounded and founded in the truth so that you don't get swayed and just easily manipulated about every, you know, every wind of doctrine that comes along that you're just going after that. But you get grounded and settled in the truth and not just relying on a man to lead you through everything and just whatever he says, you know, I'm just going to believe it and know it for yourself. Be careful who your friends are. Be careful who you listen to. And watch out for the flattery. The people you, you, you surround yourself with, they will influence you. No doubt about that. Joash picked the wrong people to have as his counselors and people influence him and led him astray, led him the wrong way. Psalm 5 verse 9 uh, you don't have to turn there. Say if you would in 2 Chronicles 24. It says, For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. So the wicked people, you know, their inward part's wickedness. Their throat's like an open sepulcher. I mean, think about it. An, an open sepulcher, it's a great, like a tomb where there's just a dead body inside, like the stench and, and you know, the, ugh, coming out of that. It says that's what their throat is like, these wicked people. But then it says, they flatter with their tongue. 
That's how they, they want to sweeten you up and butter you up in order to, to deceive you and to, to influence you. Psalm 12, 2 says, They speak vanity, every one of his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. This is how they got to Joash. They made obeisance to him, they flattered him, and then they you know, influenced him to do wickedly. And their throat was like an open sepulcher because they were leading them into serving idols and going to the groves and everything else. Look at verse number 19 there in 2 Chronicles 24. The Bible says, Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord, and they testified against them, but they would not give ear. So now, God's still giving them another chance. He's sending the prophets to them. But what happened? He didn't retain what he was taught by Jehoiada at all because he was just relying on a man. If he would have learned... He could have at least heard the word of the Lord from another prophet saying, look, you're going the wrong way. You're wicked. Get right with God. And something could have resonated with him if he was actually receiving what he'd been taught this whole time instead of just relying on, blindly on someone else. He could have been turned away, but he didn't. He didn't give ear. Verse number 20, it says, And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people, and said unto them, Thus saith God, why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord that ye cannot prosper? Because ye have forsaken the Lord, he hath also forsaken you. Now we're going to see why people conspire, his own servants conspired against him to kill him, Joash. We didn't learn that in 2, Chronic or 2 Kings chapter 12. But now we see here the son of Jehoiada, I mean Jehoiada, this important figure in Joash's life. All the way until he died at 130 years old, Joash is listening to Jehoiada. Jo he's building up the house of the Lord. They're performing the daily sacrifices and everything else that needs to be done. Everything's going right. He dies. Now he's getting steered the wrong way. So then his, the very son says, look, and he cries out against him. This is wicked. Get right with God. You've forsaken God and he's forsaken you. But basically he's saying, you know, turn back to God so he could turn back to you. Verse number 21, And they conspired against him and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. Joash had Jehoiada's son killed at the commandment of the king. He ordered the death of the son of the man that he was listening to that preached this same exact thing. They believed the same way. He was preaching the word of the Lord to him here. But now he's rejecting it because he's allowed himself to be influenced by wicked people. Because he was not a strong leader himself. He was not rooted down in the truth. He just relied on other people all his days. And now it just, it just got him down this, this horrible downward spiral to the point to where he's just going to be killed in, in a fashion that's, that's completely dishonorable. Verse number 22 there says, Thus Joash the king remembered not the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but slew his son. And when he died, he said, The Lord look upon it and require it. That's what Zechariah said. He says, God, you, you look at this and deal with this. I mean, th think about how, raw, how, how horribly wicked that is. Because it says, his father Jehoiada. Why is it his father? Because he raised him from an infant. He was like his son. This Zechariah is like his brother. And his brother's calling him out and tell him, hey, you know, get right with God. You've forsaken God because now you're serving idols. And he has him killed. And he says, God's going to deal with you. Verse number 23, and it came to pass at the end of the year that the host of Syria came up against him and they came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the princes of the people from among the people and sent all the spoil of them unto the king of Damascus. For the army of the Syrians came with a small company of men. And the Lord delivered a very great host into their hand because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. So they executed judgment against Joash. That's also very interesting. So when, when Zechariah said, hey, you've forsaken the Lord, so the Lord's forsaken you. It doesn't matter now. If you remember, we, we've been reading about... Um, the Syrians and how much trouble they were causing for, for Jerusalem and, and for Israel and how they had come and they had been 
under, you know, they, they'd been decimated. And then, and then finally they had this great victory over the Syrians, right? And Hazael was, was cast out, and now they're, they're kind of getting back in the swing of things, and everything seems to be going right. Hazael still has a very small company. They have a small army. Yet when they come in and attack, it doesn't matter how big Judah's army is. It doesn't matter because God wasn't with them. He's forsaken them. And he delivered them just as much as Israel was able to defeat, you know, multitudes as the sand by the seashore for multitude with a small number of people when they're doing right. And he could deliver the whole great host into their hand. Well, he did the exact same thing just with the roles reversed because now they're doing wickedly. And it's the same, you know, you read the, the blessings and the cursings in the book of Deuteronomy and he says, you know, hey, one of you will, will chase 10 and 10 of you will chase a thousand when God's with you. But when God's not with you, when you're being cursed, basically he says it's going to be the other way around. 10 of them is going to chase a thousand of you. And that's what happened here. And, and God's word just rings true over and over and over again because they're not relying on, um, on God. And it says, um, verse number 25 there, And when they were departed from him, for they left him in great diseases, his own servants conspired against him for the blood of the sons of Jehoiada the priest, and slew him on his bed, and he died. And they buried him in the city of David, but they buried him not in the sepulchres of the kings. And these are they that conspired against him, Zabad the son of Shimeath, and Ammonitus, and Jehozabad, the son of Shimrith, a Moabitess. And, um, of course, these people that conspired against them were wicked people anyway. I mean, that's why they bring up it's, a, it's an Ammonite and a Moabite that kill him. Just, just to add more insult to his death. He was conspired against and he was killed by an Ammonite and a Moabite. And he wasn't even buried in, with the kings because they had no respect for him. Jehoiada was. He wasn't even technically the king. But Joash was not, and he was not remembered. And what, what a shame, because he had every opportunity. And kids, listen up, because this is important. Joash grew up in a Christian home. He grew up being raised by a man that was a man of God. By a priest, by someone who had the word of God and was doing great things for God and was trying to set the people right with God. But he didn't really listen and didn't let it sink down and didn't receive what he was being taught for years and years and years. And because he didn't really receive it and he didn't grow and didn't have his own faith and just relied on someone else to do everything for him, he was led astray and led to do very wicked things and his life ended miserably. It's important to stay with it for you to have your own faith in God and to stand firm on that faith and not to be shaken or moved. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these stories that we're reading in, uh, in the book of 2 Kings. God, I pray that you would please help us to make the applications necessary in our own lives. Lord, help us not to just take anything for granted that we hear, but it, Lord, help us to follow good leaders and to to, that you would help those leaders to lead by example and, to, and by doing, dear Lord, that, that we can provide a, a good example for others to follow as we try to follow you. And I pray that you would please uh, just help us all to not ever just follow anyone blindly, but that we would compare everything with Scripture and that we would only do the things that are right and pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.